Hey everybody, welcome to Monday Night Bible Study. I am Pastor Jackie and I'm so thankful that you're with us. And um, I just appreciate those that have gathered here this evening and those that are gathering online. And I would ask you that you just hit the share button and let everybody know that you are friends with that we're live. If you tried to join the service yesterday, we had some, I guess you could say, technical difficulties. I got some messages last night asking where we were and, and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know what? Thank God for technology. But with technology, sometimes stuff happens, right? But we're here today, and uh, we're going to just get into the Word and today we've been filming new podcasts. We've got lots of stuff coming in the future and just looking forward to all the things that God has in store. Um, I first want to take a minute before we get into the Word tonight and do as I try to always do and invite you that are watching um, to come and visit us sometime at High Praises Church. We're in the middle of Maryville, Tennessee, 1412 East Broadway Avenue in Maryville. At least that's the first campus, and there's more to come, right? And uh, we will be here on Wednesday afternoons at 6.30 for chapel. Man, what a great time we have at chapel. And uh, on Sunday mornings at 10, and then, of course, every Monday at 6 with prayer at 7. So I'm, uh, I'm just really grateful of all the opportunities that I have to get to uh, share the good news of Jesus Christ with whoever wants to listen. So before we get started, let's, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you, God, for your goodness and your graciousness. I ask you, Lord, to just uh, minister to us through your word. We realize and understand and know that your word is life-changing. It's powerful. It's direct. It is, uh, it is enlightening. So God, I pray that you would just speak to us through your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, I want to talk about a couple different things. Um, I just really feel like it's important um, to, to understand a couple things about a couple different subjects. And one of them is fear, or as I've got it written in my notes, fear not. And then the other one is our words. And I believe one is connected so closely to the other because one causes the other to be uh, powerful or powerless. As a matter of fact, I, I guess I should uh, change that. Your words are powerful, but they go one way or the other. They go one direction of this. So it doesn't take the power away if they're negative words. It just puts power in the wrong place. Um, I'm going to start with a, a, a verse in Matthew, the 14th chapter and the 27th verse. It says, But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. So, the first thought that I had, good evening, y'all. We've got some new folks coming in. And um, the, the, the first thing I think about when I see that Jesus said, first of all, Jesus knew who he was. He understood his, his job. And he understood the importance of why he was here. So he didn't waste his time doing stuff that didn't matter. How many times have I regretted spending so much time on a project and then to look at it and it go and I go, that was a total waste of my time. Do you understand that Jesus never did something on the earth and then said, well, that was a waste of time. So if he said something, it meant something. And he said be not afraid. We could say that right there and fold our Bibles and our tablets and we could leave and have a message that would be strong enough to give us power over a lot of things that we'll face today, tomorrow, and the next day. Because God never comes with a, with a message of fear. 
I believe that with my whole heart. God never gives a message of fear. Now, I was raised, and, and, and I always like to, to say that I honor my heritage, and I'm thankful for how I was raised. But I also know that a lot of things that we, are, that we come into contact with in our life are because of culture and not necessarily um, because it's in the Word. And, man, I was raised in churches that would preach hell so hot you could feel the heat. As a matter of fact, the reason at six years old I told my daddy I wanted to be saved was because I went to, uh, I don't know if anybody else remembers or I don't know if they, I was living in West Virginia, so they did it in that region. They would go around to these different churches and they would play these, these uh, movies. And you would watch these movies. And this one that I watched was about hell. I was six. And I remember I, I wanted to, because it was a movie, and of course, we weren't allowed to go to movies, so to go to a movie in a church was, it was exciting. I was sitting on the front row, and I remember it absolutely scared the heebie-jeebies out of me. Um, and it was about going to hell. And I got saved. <laughs> I want you to know, I got saved, and I was six years old. It was in January, and of course, the culture in which, um, in the, the culture in which I grew up, the the way that it happened was you get saved and then they take you to the creek and baptize you because I don't remember a church at all that I ever grew up in that had a baptistry. Well, I'll take that back. There was one, but I remember actually when they put it in. And we just went to the creek. And there was ice that was covering over the creek, and my daddy said, Jack, why don't we wait until um, it's a little warmer weather, Now I don't remember this conversation, but I've been told about this conversation, Jack, why don't we uh, uh, wait until it's a little warmer weather and, until you get baptized, you're a good boy, that's okay, you'll be all right, you know, this is my daddy, and I, I was told that I looked at him and said, but daddy, I don't want to go to hell. And so that Sunday morning, they literally uh, broke the ice in the creek. Now, I do remember that. I remember. I can remember how cold that water was, and I remember getting baptized. And um, so, you know, I was raised in a culture that, that preached a lot of fear, preached a lot about hell and about the... Um, the results of sin, the results of not trusting Jesus. And I can remember when I was 17, 18, 19 years old, and when I was literally, absolutely not living for Jesus, I can literally remember going to sleep and hoping that I didn't die. Now, why in the world I wouldn't just get saved or, or rededicate my life to the Lord, whatever you want to call it. Well, I wouldn't do that, but, but I didn't. So therefore, fear did not cause me to maintain my relationship with God. Because I believed at six years old, if I died without Jesus, I'd go to hell. Well, guess what? I believed at 18, 17, 19, I believed then if I did not accept Jesus as my Savior, that I would literally go to hell. But it wasn't enough to keep me in relationship with Jesus. That's why, my friend, I don't preach fear. That's why I don't preach that, you know, you got to quit this, quit this, quit this, quit this. Are there things to quit? Are there things to be afraid of or, or have a fear of if you don't know Jesus? Absolutely. But I also know that the love for Jesus is what keeps me in a place of deep desire to please Him today. Understanding His love for me is what keeps me in a place of wanting to please Him with everything that I have. It's not from a fear of not pleasing Him. Now, I don't want to not please Him. 
And I understand that bad things happen when we are, you know, when we do bad things. That's kind of a different message. But my my main thought today and the reason that I'm going here is because Jesus said, first of all, we've established Jesus don't just make statements, right? There's nothing... uh, we don't read in the Bible that Jesus said, Hey, boys, come here. Let me tell you a big tale just for entertainment. Hey, let me, let me tell you something just because it's funny. When Jesus spoke, it was recorded as something very relevant to us. So he said, Be not afraid. God never uses a message of fear to move us toward himself you can start from the Old Testament and trace all the way through the New Testament and you'll see that every time that God manifest himself to people every time he sent angels or even just like in this scripture every time that Jesus himself came to us there always come a message be not afraid Fear not. What did the angel say to Mary? Don't be afraid. Every time that there's a... Fear doesn't come from God. It comes from Satan. Because he uses... Satan uses fear to paralyze us. Now, let me, let me take a, a side note here real quick. And then I'll get back to the notes that I have. Fear is something that comes from an understanding a lot of times. It comes from something that we don't understand or an understanding that we have done something that we shouldn't have. That's why we have to understand the grace of God. Grace is not a license to do stuff wrong. (laughs) Grace is not a license to do things that we're not supposed to. But we need to get in our minds and understand that we are spirits which is perfectly aligned with God's word when we get saved. But our flesh is not. We live in a, a, fle- in a body of flesh that has desires produced by the world that it was born into. Excuse me. My flesh has certain desires because, excuse me, because of the things that the flesh enjoys. I don't try to not sin because I think God stops loving me. But the plan to get to God is set up in a way with our believing how do you how do you receive Jesus believe and confess um, the plan of God and the or, or you could say the law of God is set up in a way that to deviate from that to get away from that takes us away from God God doesn't get mad at us because we sin against him I don't believe that but when we sin against him, we step. We are stepping away, and I'm talking about deliberate sin. I'm not talking about making mistakes. I'm, you know what? You don't want to keep making the same mistakes, but but I think God's grace. A lot of times, we don't give it credit for covering the shortfalls of our flesh. You know, like for instance, you say, "Well, I I'm not going to sin." Okay, so you never get impatient with your husband or your wife. Impatience is not something that pleases God um, because that's opposite of one of the fruit of the Spirit, long-suffering, right? My point is we all, whether it's this big or this big, we make involuntary mistakes. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you just absolutely make a decision, you're going to turn and you're just... You're just over it. You're going to do whatever you want. You don't care. It's almost like you flip your nose at God. He still doesn't get mad at you. But what has happened at that point, sin brings guilt. Guilt brings shame. 
Shame stops you from having faith. Why? Because shame and guilt bring attention on the weakness of the flesh and not you're not then focusing on the power of your spirit through faith. So just understand that uh, you know there's there's a lot of Christians and preachers um, that still preach a lot of fear and I'm not finding fault with them. I'm just giving you reason why I choose to, to preach life, faith, and love. Because the word says there's three things, hope, faith, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So I believe that um, it should be my job to go around putting hope in people and not putting fear in people. Because we hear so much fear being talked about, fear of sickness. Say, oh, what are you talking about? People talking about fear of sickness. Oh, it's called maybe lately a pandemic. So there's a fear of sickness being preached and talked about. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying that I haven't said it because I have, but. During this whole thing, I would not even speak the word of the reason for the pandemic. <laughs> Starts with C. Because I didn't want, nor do I now, want to give life to it. But what I did preach then, what I will preach now, is that we have power over anything with a name. Amen? So... Why should we preach about sickness other than the fact that we have power over sickness? Why should we want to promote the, the fear of disease? The fear of um, what's going to happen in the world? That's, that's a big topic today. What's going to happen with the United States of America? I got a, uh, I got an, uh, a message today, today, an email from someone that gave me a... Uh, statistic of how many people in America do say that they do not believe in God now opposed to what it used to be and my my thing about that is um, I can either eat I can focus on that and I can preach about that statistic and talk about how bad it is or I can continue to preach or you can continue to preach talk share whatever whoever you are about the hope that people have and believe that God will take that seed and grow that seed because it's not about beating people up and making them scared that if I don't if I don't do this or if I don't do that it's about wanting people and teaching people how to fall in love with the heart of who God is as I said earlier the reason I want to do more I've been at this church quite frankly um, since about 9.30 this morning, something like that. And we've been filming all day long. And this is, if you want to look at it this way, this is my fourth message that I have preached today. Um, and I'm so excited about that. It's when I feel the most full and, and, and excited about who I am. Why? Because it's an opportunity to tell more and more and more people about the hope that we have and I promise you not one time today have I said in any of the recordings that we've made have I said um, you better watch out God's going to get you <laughs> not one time because I believe God does want to get you he wants to get you into prosperity he wants to get you into heaven he wants to get you into health he wants to get you into those things so um the way it's said a lot in the world today about demons even, it makes people afraid. Let me make something clear. Satan has no power over the power of God. 
Are there demons? You better believe it. Do they want to d- destroy you and destroy everything in this world? You better believe it. But if you want to have an overcoming spirit over them, you better understand who you are and not be afraid or intimidated by them because Satan doesn't play fair. He doesn't play on a fair playing ground. You know why? Because he can't win that way. He can't go toe-to-toe with the power of God and come out anywhere other than defeated. So what he wants to do, what? Steal, kill, and destroy you. So if he can't if he can't kill you, he wants to steal your joy, your power, your strength, and then of course he'll circle back around and he'll kill you if he gets all those things. Um it's it's okay, I believe, to preach about the devil and his demons if that's what you want to preach about and talk about. But preach that we have authority over them. Preach about it in a way that's always a reminder that in our encounters with the devil, he's always defeated. If you hadn't read a book by Kenneth Hagin called um, The Believer's Authority, read it, get it, learn it, get it in your heart. Because The Believer's Authority... um, That law, and I believe that to be nothing but a law. The believer's authority law says you may not have the physical power to um, outwit Satan or whatever, beat him, but you do have the spiritual power because you have the right to use the authority of God. Fear is not a message of the church of the living God. It shouldn't be. Faith is a message of the church. Happiness, good cheer, those are messages of the church. Be not afraid is the message of the church. If you're online today, if you're watching, if you can, you may be watching at work and can't, but if you uh, say it in your mind, if if you can't say it out loud, say this. I want everybody to say it with me if you, if you would. I am of good cheer. I am not afraid. I fear not. I have faith. I have good cheer. I am not afraid. I fear not. Praise God. So we should fear not because that's what Jesus said. So how do we keep from it? We have to resist it. In uh, 2 Timothy 1.7... Uh, You probably know this by heart, but I'm going to read it anyway. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. Fear is a spirit. Fear, the spirit of fear does not come from God. Period. It's kind of like grief. Grief is a spirit. And I want you to know that I have battled that spirit. Um, and I've heard people, I've had people say to me that there's good grief. I looked, up, I looked up the definition of the word grief. And there's nothing good in it. If you look up the spirit of fear, or, or the, the word fear, there's nothing good in it. So... When the word says, I want to clear this up, and I want you to understand this. When the word talks about having the fear of God, understand that what it's talking about in that um, in that passage or passages, it means respect. You have respect. But fear is not something that you want to play with. So you have to resist it. I heard uh, T.D. Jakes preach this years and years ago. That uh, in, and I don't have this in my notes. It just kind of come to my heart. Um, When the scripture says, and I believe it's in James 4, 7. If it's wrong, forgive me. But James 4, 7 says, Submit yourself therefore to God. 
resist the devil and he will flee. He said in that message, he said resisting in that scripture means do the exact opposite of what Satan's trying to get you to do. Because if Satan's trying to get you to sin, I promise you, God is not orchestrating that. So you need to resist that and move in another direction. So my message or my word to you in this little talk today or teaching is resist the urge, the desire, the natural feeling because it comes natural to our bodies and our minds to fear. It really does. It comes natural to because it's exciting to fear. It's kind of like uh, some people actually enjoy going to haunted houses um, and they enjoy the part of getting the soup scared out of them. I don't personally enjoy that, so I pass those up, right? I'm not condemning. I'm just saying I don't, I don't want none of that. But so, so we have to resist. If you don't want something in your life, what do you do? You resist it. A little kid that don't like, you know, strained peas, they will spit them back out on you. Um, whatever Satan tries to get you to bring into your life, first of all, how do I know if it's of God and how, it, how do I know if it's not of God? If it's not in the Word, if it's not endorsed by the Word, it's not of God. Because the Word covers everything. And you say, everything, everything. Now, you may, have to, you may have to take it and you may have to break it down. It may not say, you know, if you're trying to figure out if it's right to buy a Ford or a Chevrolet, guess what? That's kind of one of those things he leaves to you, right? Um, and yes, that's a little facetious and silly. But, but so, so that you will find things in life that are of an earthly matter that may not be in the Word. But everything that affects you in somehow, some way, it's covered by the Word of God. So you can use faith. To resist fear when it tries to come on you. Faith is one of the most powerful tools and weapons that we've ever been given. Faith is not a doctrine. Well, I'm of this faith or that faith. Well, I understand what they're saying and I'm not trying to pick them apart, but that's not faith. Faith is confidence that something exists other than what we see, smell, taste, touch, or hear. Faith is is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I've used this in the past, a long time ago. I'll never use it again because I don't believe it this way anymore. But I've heard people say that they're walking in blind faith. No such thing. Faith always has an object to believe. Um, you know, I had faith that this, plat this little this stand would hold my... Hold my stuff today. I had faith in it. So therefore I acted on what I believed. Where was the object of my faith in that? The object was this. So if I'm believing for healing, who do I believe is doing the healing? Jesus Christ. The work of Jesus Christ. And so my faith is always in something. I get in my car and I, I, I mean, I believe tonight. As sure as I'm standing here, I'm going to get in my truck. I'm going to drive to my house without any problems. I believe that. Where's my faith? Well, of course, ultimately in God, but stay with me. I'm making a point. My faith is that my truck's going to start. My faith is in my truck that it still runs. Because I've had cars. I talked about one yesterday that I didn't have much faith in. Some days I made it. Some days I didn't. But I have to resist what comes against the word. Satan will never tell you anything that will bring success in your life. So if something pops up in your life and it goes in direct opposition to the word of God and you feel like, oh, it'll be okay, that's Satan lying to you. Resist that. How do you resist it? You go the, the opposite direction of what is being told to you in that lie. So you have to resist fear. Somebody say, fear, I resist you. We have to get up every day and, and make a decision 
that we are not going to walk in fear. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I resist fear. Amen? Refuse to fear. In the name of Jesus, refuse to be afraid. Take his written word at what it says. Um, and then confess what God said you could have. I do have power. I do have love. I do have a sound mind. Um, and then after that, don't talk fear. Um, don't talk about what you're afraid of. If you're dealing with fear, and see there's a difference in accepting it and walking in it and dealing with it. We all are going to deal with being afraid of something. You're going to see something you don't understand, and you have a decision to make. Will I be fearful? Will I walk in fear? Or will I resist it, decide I'm not going to fear, and move on? Uh, a lot of times the unknown is something that we that we will openly confess and therefore we give life to fear. Oh, I don't know about that. I'm not sure. Or worse than just a, a general thing, let me say, oh, the diagnosis was X, Y, Z and we talk about it. People that love you and understand you and are willing to um, do life with you will understand when you tell them. I was asked just, you know, recently, um, is your allergies flaring up? First of all, I don't have allergies. I don't accept allergies. No, I don't have that. No, my aller I, I don't own allergies. They're not allowed. And I said to this person, I said, well... I said, uh, I just ain't going to talk about it. And they went, oh, okay. Because they understood that I didn't mean that rudely. But I also believe if you, if you allow the circumstance, because here's, here's, here's what we hear a lot of times. It's flu season. It ain't flu season in my house. It might be flu season somewhere else, but it ain't flu season in my house. Oh, it's allergy season. Not in my house. If I have symptoms, you know what I'll do? I'll pray over it. If I need to deal with them in some way with, with medicine, I'll do that. But I will not confess that they are mine. I will not confess that it is mine. Because when I say that and I accept those things, and I'm just using that as an example, it could be anything. I'm not denying that the symptoms are there. I'm not denying that, 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 that stuff exists. But what I'm denying is the fact that I'm, I'm denying Satan the right to put it in my life. And I say no. I will not talk it. Um, Proverbs 6, 2. Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. With your mouth, you're either going to give God or Satan dominion. Amen? With your words, you're either going to give Satan or God dominion. I want that to sink in a little bit. Because... When you were born again, you confessed Jesus as your Savior. In uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10. You said, the Lord is my Savior. Well, what exactly does that mean? I think a lot of times I heard um, uh, Pastor Keith Moore say, <clears throat> and I think I've shared this before. He said, um, why is it so easy for people to accept Jesus? but yet so hard for them to accept healing. And the reason is, and I agree with him, we've preached salvation for centuries. Thank the Lord. That's good. That's awesome. But we, we shouldn't stop there. <laughs> Jesus is our Savior. Savior from sin. 
Savior from sickness. Savior from disease. Anything that was brought on by the curse. And you know what that is? I'm going to tell you. Anything that is not productive, is not good, is not life-giving, is not of God, that's what was brought on by the curse. Jesus Christ died on a cross to do away with the curse. Not just reverse the curse, do away with it. And so when you... Um, we're born again, you confess the Lord Jesus Christ. You confess Jesus as your Lord. And at that point, Jesus has dominion in your life. And um, we, have to, we, have, we have to keep it that way. We have to remember ourselves and remind our flesh, remind our, our brains, if you would, because, you know, those thoughts will roll around. And if you see something negative on television, you see something negative on the news, see something negative on the, in the newspaper, on the social media, those thoughts will begin, and you can't stop them. You can't stop those thoughts. What you have to do is take authority over your atmosphere and purposefully only allow those things in your heart and only the things to take root in your heart will determine who you give dominion to. Um, so many people are offended today. So many people get offended because, and here's the reason we get offended. We get offended because our pride gets in the way of what we're trying to do. Satan uses the smallest of things to bring offense in our life. And I believe the only way to stop that is to keep clear borders for Satan. That's why I had a guy tell me one time, don't pick fights with the devil. He Right over in that other, he was, uh, he's already gone to heaven. And they uh, had moved away and he wasn't a part of our church for a while before he did. But a good man, love him, meant well. Don't pick fights with the devil thought about that you, you don't have to pick a fight with the devil the devil's job all he tries to do is to to weaken you and to get you in a place where you will allow him in he's always coming at us that's why you have to set a, a complete direct and and very obvious boundary to where he knows he can't get that's why I make the statement, I cannot be offended. Is it because I don't feel offense at times? Oh, I feel it. But all that is, feeling, feeling the spirit of offense is a symptom of what I'm not going to allow in my life. Like um, if I feel a symptom in my body, a pain or something, I speak to that area in my body and quite frankly it quits. Um, I'll give this testimony. I don't know that I've ever given this testimony a year or two ago, um, quite frankly, I was, I, I, I was thinking a little stronger in my arms than I really probably was physically, and I was at the gym, and I was working out, and uh, this shoulder didn't like it at all, and uh, then when I'd start to raise my hands, this shoulder would start to catch, and, you know, what did I do? I started having thoughts. Of you know, I know people that have had frozen shoulders, and and I've had you no know, people that strain, and and those thoughts started coming. And what I what did I do next? I started speaking to that shoulder in the name of Jesus. And today, I don't have any problems out of that shoulder. Is it because I'm special? No, but it's because that's what you have to do. The Bible says, "Speak to the mountain," and you say, "Is that a mountain?" It would be if you can't raise your arm. Amen? And I don't want to not be able to raise my arm. Hey, if you're okay with that, I'm not finding fault or, or, or judging you. I don't want that. So Satan brings thoughts of offense to me, but I refuse them. I choose to walk in love and forgiveness. And, and quite frankly, sometimes you just have to have the spirit of overlook in your life. Overlook stuff. Amen. The course 
of Satan's attack over your life will always be through certain weaknesses and fear. Don't allow him in. If there's areas in your life that you're not strong, if there's areas in your life that you're stronger than in others, and if there's areas that you're still working on, pay attention to that. Um, pay attention to the things that bother you about people. Because people's not our enemy, but Lord, how mercy the devil uses them a lot. Amen? Amen? The Bible says that God has not given you um, the spirit of fear. I want to point this out. I had this thought this afternoon. He said he has not given you. And what is that? That's the real you. What is that? Say this with me. I am a spirit. See, I'm not a body. I'm not a mind. I am a spirit. So I believe when he's saying... I have not given you the spirit of fear, but he's given you the spirit of love and of sound mind. Uh, fear isn't coming from within you. Fear will always come from things on the outside of you. Um, fear is not your friend. Fear is a tactic of the enemy. If you know something's not Good, have wisdom. Don't have fear. If you know that something's going to cause pain, have wisdom. But don't be scared. Does that make sense? Well, that's just what we say, Pastor. Uh, well, don't say it. <laughs> don't say the wrong things. The power, Death and life is in the power of your tongue. Fear isn't something that's coming from the inside of you. You have a spirit of love. So say you have a spirit of love. Amen? You have a spirit of power. So say that you have a spirit of power. So if something startles you and you're tempted to say, Oh, that scared me. You say, Oh, I have power over you. In the name of Jesus. Something um, maybe, I don't know. If you're in a relationship with someone and someone, uh, they say something. And quite frankly, it's, it rubs you the wrong way. Just say, oh, I have love for you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> oh, that sounds easy, Pastor. It is not easy. But we don't need easy. We need possible. And guess what? All things are possible to those that love the Lord and believe in Him. Amen? Just remember that. All things are possible. So you don't need easy. I like easy. I enjoy easy. But you don't have to have it. Here's the deal. Whatever you confess will begin to dominate your life. Amen? Say this with me. I am never afraid. I do not know fear. I have the spirit of power. I have the spirit of love. I have the spirit of sound mind. So that takes me to my next thought. Words. Do not fear, but use your words to take authority over the fear. Use your words to take authority over anything that is in opposition to what God's word says. Matthew 12, 37 says, By your words... Thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. You know what he was saying? It's not about what's going in. It's about what's coming out. You know what that says to me? It's not so much about your works. Oh, don't, don't jump conclusions now. I believe in living clean according to the word of God. But I also don't have a problem being friends with people that may have different opinions of what clean is than me. I'm not offended 
Why am I not offended? Because I believe that what goes into a person is not necessarily... I, it can definitely affect and it will... If you let the wrong thing go in too long, then it's going to affect what comes out. But I don't judge people by what I see. But the, the word says you'll be justified by the words that you speak. You'll be justified by the word, or you'll be condemned by the words that you speak. So if you want to know someone's real heart, don't watch their actions nearly as much as you listen to their heart speak. Their actions may be a good indication of what's in their heart. Okay, I'll give you that. But um, I think about that so much when I think about uh, how people are judged on their persona and how they dress and what they look like and how they, you know, uh, what kind of car they, they drive. I'll be totally forthcoming through the years. I have literally thought, well, I'm a pastor, so shouldn't I have this kind of car or whatever? And it's like, <laughs> I'm going to drive what I want to drive. And it don't affect my preaching at all. It just don't. So I'm going to drive my old cars. And Now, if I want to buy a new car, I'll buy, I, we bought a new car in 2014. There's nothing wrong with that either. But my point is, that's not what makes you who you are. So don't judge people by that. Because on, on the flip side of that, that person that's, you know, in that big fancy car and that big fancy house, they might have a big fancy uh, debt book too. So I don't want that. <laughs> Amen? So... Just understand that Jesus himself made this statement. Words, he's the one that said Matthew 12, 37 that we just read. And what he's saying is words are much more important than a lot of people realize. Uh, for instance, do you remember Job? I've had people tell me, oh, I disagree with your view of Job. But I believe that Job brought everything that happened to him on himself. Oh, but what does it say in there about him being chosen of God? Well, he was. He was God's man. But he also, at the end of the story, he said, that thing that I have feared has come upon me. Fear will draw mess in the same way faith will draw God in. Job's words were also this in Job 19 too. He said, how long will I be vexed or will... Will ye vex my soul? He was talking about the people that had gathered around. You, you can go read the story. He said, how long will ye vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? Words make us or break us. Words heal us or make us sick. And according to the teaching of the Bible, words uh, destroy us or words fill us full of life. Words are important. Words either make us happy or sad. Words make us full of health or they will bring sickness on our life. You say, how is that? Your life will follow your words. Um, I'm healthy and I really am in the physical and the spiritual. But, but I say it even when I don't always feel it because I know it and therefore my body lines up with it. Amen? According to the teaching of the Bible, words help us or hinder us. Words that we spoke yesterday make life what it is today. So when Jesus said, or it's what he's basically saying in, in Mark eleven twenty three. He said, he shall have whatsoever he saith. So you could read, read it like this if you wanted to. He shall have the words that he speaks. So the question then makes me go, what have I said today? <laughs> what, have I, what kind of life have I spoken around me 
today? What's it going, what's it going to come up tomorrow? It ain't talking about your feelings right there because you have to take control of your feelings and say the words that line up with God's word whether you want to or not. Amen? Power of life. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Say this. If you're watching, say this with us. Life is in the power of my tongue. I will speak life with my tongue. And I will receive life. Because see, the word of God is, I believe, like a well. And you can have a well, but if you never draw out of it, you won't get anything. Now, I, I remember um, when I was a little kid, my, my dad was born in Olive Hill, Kentucky. And his grandmother, now she passed away before I come along, but not too long before I was born. And so therefore, when I was a little kid, her home place, as it was affectionately called by the family, was still intact, and we went out there. There was one light bulb hanging in the middle of every room, and there was no uh, indoor bathroom, and there was a well. And we were out in the country in um, Kentucky, Carter County, Kentucky. And I thought it was the coolest thing that for the water to my mama to cook with, the water to brush our teeth, um, all of that, we would have to go right outside the back door and there was a well there and we would draw water out of the well. The point is we got the water out of the well because we went and got it. The word has is like a well of, of good things for us in our life. How do we get the, the, the life out of the well? We speak it. The word is full of life, but we have to speak it. And it says in Proverbs 10, 11, the mouth of a righteous man is a well of life. So righteous, what is righteousness? Righteousness is standing upright with God, living upright with God. What does that mean? Living according to the word. Think of it like this. Whatever you speak into your children, that's the life that's going to come from them. Um, children are a product of your words. This church is a product of our declaration. That's why we, every week, right up there on that screen, we declare, when we give, we declare that we have certain things. Because, first of all, we only declare what the Word says we can have. The Word says if we desire it, we can be debt-free. So we said debt freedom for our church years before it happened. But guess what happened? Debt freedom. Say this with me. I know I got a lot of confessing out here today, don't I? Say this. According to the New Testament, in Christ, I am righteous. Therefore, my mouth is like a well of life. I speak the words of life concerning everything around me. In Jesus' name. Um, I've got two more things, but I want to touch this one more. I've just got a few minutes here. Um, the next thing I was going to talk about was, was pleasant words. I'll give you that scripture if you want. It's Proverbs 16, 24. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb sweet to the soul and health to the, the bones. So, um, Fred, use pleasant words to your wife. Okay, I'll just, that'll be my teaching about pleasant words. <laughs> and you'll also be a smarter man for it. Proverbs 10, the last thing I want to talk, talk about, and I'll, I'll do it in a quick way so that we can get into prayer in just a moment, but it's atmosphere. I want to talk about atmosphere. Proverbs 10, 13 and Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4, and I'm going to just put them all together. It says, in the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found. That is Proverbs 10, 13. And then uh, parts of three, uh, 24, 3 and 4 says, Through wisdom is a house 
builded. And by understanding it is established. And by knowledge shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Spiritual things are created by words. But guess what? Natural things and physical things are also created by words. Amen? God, who is a spirit, said, he said this, let there be an earth in the book of Genesis. He said, let there be a lot of things, but just to sum it up. And guess what there became? An earth. I am a spirit. I live in a body I possess. It, so I'm a spirit just like God. And he gives me the power. Atmosphere was, I, I say it like this a lot of times. God created places before he created people. Places are important. It's important where you live. It's important where you work. It's important where you go to church. He created places before he created people. Atmosphere is created with words. What kind of atmosphere do you want in your home? Start speaking that. What kind of atmosphere do you want at your business? What kind of atmosphere do you want um, in, in your space? In my personal space, what kind of atmosphere do I want? Well, I have control over that. It doesn't matter where I'm at. I have control over that. Because even though these things may come toward me, I, I, can, I can put the shield of faith. Isn't that what it's called? The shield of faith. Faith is confidence that something exists other than what I see, smell, taste, touch, or hear. So I use the shield of faith, and it blocks off all that mess that Satan's trying to attack me with. So I am protecting my sphere. So your atmosphere is created by the words you choose to speak. Your, your atmosphere is chosen by the words that you allow to be spoken or not around you. And I'm going to tell you something. Um, if you've ever walked into a room where, where a lot of harsh words had just been spoken, they linger. There's a heavy spirit around that. Because your words create. Your words is important. Children brought up in an atmosphere of wrong words have a warped understanding of what true happiness is. That's why generational curses are passed on and passed on and passed on. They can be stopped. So if it's going on in your home right now, you can stop it. You can reverse it. You can, you can uh, uh, totally eliminate it. But you have to recognize it and come against it with the power of love. So a lot of times um, we don't educate ourselves or the people around us in the right way, and so therefore, um, our atmospheres are kind of whatever, you know, we have to take whatever we get. Well, I'm telling you right now, not true. I got one more confession we're going to make tonight. Say this with me. I create the very atmosphere around me with my words. I speak words of wisdom, which is God's words. I speak words of faith, which is God's words. I speak words of love, which is God's words. And my atmosphere is and will be filled with good things in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And I appreciate everybody that's here that come for Bible study. Um, we're about to have prayer right here in the sanctuary of High Praises Church. And you know what? There's no time or distance in the spirit realm, so you could have prayer right there where you are with us. Just create the atmosphere. That's what we just said we could do. Create the atmosphere and enter into prayer for the next hour. And um, I believe God, good things, will, or God things, I can say that too, will come into your life. God bless you. Come see us at High Praises Church. And thank you for being with us tonight.